thank you very much for the invitation to Budapest. I'm very glad to be here because it's one of my favorite cities, really. And I know many friends and colleagues over here. It was a pleasure always to collaborate with my colleagues here in Budapest, one of the most exciting cities in Europe. And I'm very pleased, actually, that Hungary is the first country to go forward with the future ICT project, you know. It noticed where the future is, where the future is happening, and so you're the core, the nucleus of what's going to happen on a worldwide scale, really. My talk today is on the subject Economics 2.0 towards a self-regulating participatory market society to counter complexity and extreme events. And it's about the age of information. What does it really mean? Well, we're kind of an information species. Information drives our decisions, our life, our history. That sets us as apart from any other species, actually. Our society now will enter a new era. There will be a major change of our society and economy driven by big data. Within just a few years, we'll collect more data than in the whole history of humankind. In about 10 years from now, we'll have brain power computing, which means that computers can do a lot of the work we're doing today. In fact, IBM's Watson now is uh, doing customer service because those people who have done it before didn't do such a good job. We also know that more than 70% of financial transactions now are performed by computers. So what are the implications of this for society? I think actually the change of our society could be as dramatic as at the time when the steam engine was invented. So we really need to think ahead to imagine the times to come and to take the right decisions. We are also entering an age of hyperconnectivity. We have connected millions of factories and cars and uh, billions of smartphones. So what does that really imply? Further on, the virtual world and the real world are growing together. That means we are creating cyber social systems. And we are entering an age where information is the oil of the 21st century. Now there have been many people, philosophers, scientists, politicians, economists, who have been thinking about how society and the economy would be organized. And people have been very much inspired by the notion of swarms. Swarm intelligence is a very modern field of science. But the idea is quite old. It's more than 300 years old. The fable of bees basically suggested this idea that a society could self-organize and even though bees are very simple entities with just a few neurons, they are creating quite complicated patterns. They have something like a society, so that's quite astonishing. And Adam Smith took it up in his famous work, The Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. He's taking this idea forward and he's formulating the idea of an invisible hand that would basically create order if just everybody would do the thing that would be best for him that would create the best outcome for society. And in fact, if we have a look at pedestrians walking, like here in a shopping center in Budapest, you see there is self-organization going on. There is um, the formation of lanes of uniform walking direction. That means the different walking directions are separating from each other and there is actually not much friction in the system. This is working quite well. If there would be an 
invisible hand organizing all this. However, it's not always like this. The invisible hand is sometimes failing. And here is an example of a terrible crowd disaster that happened in Germany during the Love Parade. So certainly nobody wanted to kill anybody during this event. Nobody wanted to harm anybody. So how can these things happen? Now, once such a thing happens, people usually point the fingers at uh, people. They're looking for scapegoats. But the problem is instability. Let's have a look at this example over here. We have uh, the task that drivers should go in a circular way without stopping, without creating accidents. And you see for some time it works, but then suddenly there is a traffic jam, a so-called phantom traffic jam. Although there is no accident and no obstacle or anything that would explain it from external reasons, you see that this traffic jam is happening and then we don't get rid of the problem anymore. Now, if you would ask drivers, how did it happen? They would say, well, there was just a stupid driver in front of me who didn't know how to drive. But in fact, now science knows it better. We have models of traffic jam formation and we know when the density exceeds a certain level, then the separation between cars is not large enough to allow drivers to adjust their speed in time. That means if there is a little bit of variation of the speed, the next driver will, will react with a delay. And in order to compensate for this delay, he or she will brake a little bit stronger, so that creates an amplification effect. And as then the next driver again has to respond to this, it creates a chain reaction a cascade effect actually, and in the end something happens that nobody wants to happen. Everybody is stopped. And um, if we extrapolate this to other kinds of situation, we can say if a system is operated in the wrong parameter regime, here too high density, then sooner or later the system will get out of control because of an instability of the system. And even if you have the best technical equipment, all the data, you have all the skills that you think would be needed, and are really trying hard to do the right thing, the system will get out of control. And there are many systems of this kind. We believe that financial instabilities uh, and also wars and conflicts are other examples of outcomes, actually, of such kind of instabilities. And the video over here is illustrating you that a small local perturbation can actually mess up all the system. Well, this is apparently a funny experiment for a rainy weekend. Uh, you need to use uh, mouse traps and put table tennis balls on top of it. This is actually not so funny because we have very similar phenomena in reality. Just take bank bankruptcy. This is a video created uh, by a colleague of mine and it shows bankruptcies all over the United States. And it looks very similar to the funny video we've seen before, but this time it's not funny at all because hundreds of banks went bankrupt. It caused uh, damage of hundreds of billions, not to talk about the people who are suffering from this. So, it's these kind of cascade effects that are creating extreme events. If we design systems in the wrong way, so unpredictability and uncontrollability are issues actually of wrong systems design and operation. 
this is something we need to take more <coughs> seriously because we have connected the whole world, we have globalized the world, and that's of course a very nice thing. It came with a lot of benefits for most people. We have now an exchange of people, money, goods, information, ideas, many new services, many new opportunities, but also the very same network infrastructure is also creating pathways for disaster spreading. And so my conclusion is actually that we have globalized our world, but we don't really scientifically understand the techno-social economic environmental systems that we have created on a global scale. We don't understand them well enough. And it requires new science. There are huge knowledge gaps. And the question is how to fill them. Do we have a chance to fill these knowledge gaps? And the answer is yes, I believe so. Because now a huge amount of data is becoming available about human activities. We talk about big data. So what could we do with it? or you know, economic productivity for science and also for the individual. I think the individual and society should actually be in the center of our attention. And Future ICT has always said we need to go from a technology-driven society to a socially-oriented technology. We've also said in the past we have created instruments to explore the world, such as telescopes and microscopes and many others. Now for the 21st century, we need new instruments and new institutions. And the question is, how would they look like? This is what Future ICT came up with. We came to the conclusion that we need to bring together data and models and people. We don't believe that there is the end of theory, that if we just have enough data, you know, machine learning will do everything for us. Will never help us to understand how the system works and how it might change. So it requires models. So what would we do? First of all, we would uh, connect data with what we call a planetary nervous system. And uh, that means this planetary nervous system would create systems to sense and understand, would measure what is the state of the world in real time, and turn data into information. Then the question, what can we do with this data? And we could feed them into models and actually look at what-if scenarios. We could uh, develop models to simulate and predict certain scenar possible scenarios and this way turn information into knowledge and finally the question what is it really good for it should be good for the people we need to turn knowledge into wisdom and that will be done by a global participatory platform to explore and interact and altogether we need to catch up with the speed at which our world is changing, so we need an innovation accelerator as well. I'll now go into the details and uh, give you some glimpse of uh, what the planetary nervous system is about, how it might work. <coughs> it's very nice actually that um, recently a new book came out, which I recommend you to buy, it's not very expensive, it's called The Human Phase of Big Data. And the fur word actually has the headline of planetary nervous system. So you can see that the idea has already spread. And I'm quite confident that it will come. <clears throat> so the goal of this planetary nervous system would be to measure the world state, but not just of the physical environment, like the Google Street View or um, But, but also uh, to, to measure the social and economic environment, to measure the social footprint, that means the implications of our decisions and actions, and to measure social capital, which is the basis actually for economic and social well-being. 
But we know, we are aware that uh, personal data are a sensitive issue, so we need to learn how to do the data mining in a privacy respecting way to avoid misuse of the data. So that also implies technical challenges, but also legal challenges and ethical challenges in general. This movie over here goes beyond the concept of open street map where a whole community, I think of 800,000 people are collecting data about all the streets and pathways in the world. The very same thing can be done actually with 3D environments. And so a colleague of mine with his colleagues actually came up with a software that was reconstructing 3D environments without even leaving the office. So they were downloading Flickr photos. Of course it takes some time to do all this. Then you have to identify where the photographers have been standing cameras have been pointing at. And then after just a day you can reconstruct the whole environment in 3D from all those 2D pictures. And you can do that with basically every place slides to show. So what is it good for? Well basically we can create new compasses for decision makers. Better compasses than just GDP per capita. Considering health, the state of the environment, social well-being and so on. <coughs> and in the past it was quite expensive to collect these kind of data. It was done just every few years. Now we are getting close to the ability to measure these quantities globally in real time and very cheaply. So this is going to change really our picture of the world and our ability to take better decisions. And in this very way we can come up with an observatory for financial instabilities, for an observatory for epidemic spreading and health risks, an observatory for wars and conflicts, or an exploratory for transport and logistics, or whatever comes to your mind actually could be turned into an observatory or exploratory uh, to really inform you better and in real time about what is going on. So we will feed it into a simulation environment, which we call the Living Earth Simulator. So we would basically integrate existing models of traffic, production, economic system, crowd behavior, social cooperation, social norms, social conflict, crime, war, and whatever into one simulation environment. And scale it up to a global scale eventually and increase the level of detail, the accuracy, as we've done that actually with weather forecasts. We know in the beginning weather forecasts were quite bad and they have become better and better over time. Now eventually I think we are at the limit what, uh, of what is physically possible. So we cannot expect a deterministic prediction of what will happen, but uh, I think it's possible to determine probabilities of certain scenarios to happen. And here's an example. While devastating pandemics have so far been rare, today's high population densities and intense mobility increasingly threaten to push epidemics to pandemic proportions. The costs of such pandemics can be immense, countless fatalities, untold physical and emotional pain, soaring healthcare costs and supply chain disruptions. Now, with GLEAM, we can analyze how infections may spread globally 
and assess the best ways to minimize their impact. By combining epidemic models with real-world data. Glean produces simulations of the global spread of infectious diseases by integrating three layers. The first layer looks at people and their geographic distribution with respect to major transportation hubs. The second layer adds data on the mobility of the people, how they commute and travel around the globe. The third and final layer adds the epidemic model, which can define complex disease scenarios and response strategies such as vaccination campaigns or emergency travel restrictions. Combining these three layers, GLEAM simulates epidemic spread at a worldwide scale. The resulting forecasts and scenario analyses help inform on how best to counter pandemic threats. So we see with this example actually that it's, it is already possible to make global scale simulations based on real data and those kinds of simulations actually are quite predictive in terms of when the disease will arrive in a certain place, uh, what will be the time when we have most infected people and so on. Now, this kind of work would have enormous benefits for society. You sometimes ask yourself, where has all the money been? Well, actually a lot of it was lost in the financial crisis, but also we spent a lot of time on managing conflict, uh, terrorism, crime, epidemics, congestion, and many other problems actually that can only be understood from a complex systems perspective. But also, there is the opportunity for new businesses. Just take Facebook, it's worth dozens of billions. So I want now to turn to this issue of the innovation accelerator. So what is the challenge of innovation? Well, according to Alexander from Humboldt, there are basically five stages of innovation. That makes it so difficult. People deny it in the first stage that innovation is required. And just take the European Commission. They always say it is, well, you know, then it's happening really. Then people deny the innovation is effective. Then people deny that the innovation is important. And uh, next, people deny that the innovation will justify the effort required to adopt it. And then finally, there is the breakthrough. People accept and adopt the innovation, enjoy its benefits, attribute it, however, to other people, and they de deny the existence of stages one to four. That means then it looks like it was always logical to do this very thing. Here are some quotes to underline this. Fooling around with alternating current is just a waste of time. Nobody will use it ever. That was a quote by Thomas Edison. We are using it now every single day. Then here's another one. It's a great invention, but who would want to use it anyway? That was the US president in 1872 after a demonstration of Bell's telephone. I think all of us have used it many times. Then Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM in 1943, said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. How wrong could you be? While theoretically and technically television may be feasible, commercially and financially it is an impossibility. And you could actually find these kind of quotes about every big innovation. So we're making a difficult life to innovators, basically. Now, how can we anyway promote innovation? Well, first of all, innovation is not a linear process. It's not a pipeline. It's more an ecosystem, actually. And it's very important to view it like an ecosystem, where it requires many species for new things to happen. 
you need to, many ideas need to come together to give rise to a really important new innovation. And diversity is very important for this, and it pays off. And in particular, this implies that we need to bring together different kinds of scientific communities. Natural scientists, engineers, and social scientists, people with an ethics background, and all this has been extremely fruitful in the future ICT. And we need to bring together scientists from many cultural backgrounds from many different countries. Now there is a great potential actually for a participatory approach. I've been at many conferences recently and no matter whether it's a, a setting where artists come together or people thinking about the future or people talking about new business opportunities, there's always one word which is extremely important, which is participation. And Wikipedia is maybe the very best example for this. Now, it collects knowledge that not even the most intelligent person in the world could write up himself or herself. It's really a collective effort. And people do it even for free. Now, it's something that wouldn't be possible without a participatory approach. And now, GitHub is becoming more and more favorite uh, to programmers. So there is this idea that you would like to change, uh, exchange code with others actually and benefit from code that others have created. In this way, creating really a new information world. Sharing, actually, is something that suddenly comes up. People are noticing you can have more if you share. Everybody of us has a lot of things at home that we don't use. So why don't we share them with other people? You know, it, Not everybody needs to have the same stuff at home if we don't use it. And there's a whole new ecology of new social media that has come up in the past years, which very much live on the social integration and activities of their users. So participation is a success principle of companies that are now worth billions of money. So you can see here a more complete picture, but not even this is complete. So it's really important to recognize that this openness and participatory character is something which is going to change the economy of the future. We are now actually using a term for this, which is prosumers, because consumers will not just be the passive people who are buying stuff that they want to have. They will be co-creating. They will be producing parts of uh, some of the products that they're actually buying and make money with this. So 3D printers, for example, really create a completely new opportunity. You can have home production now. But the question is, what are you going to print out? And now how useful is it going to be? And so you may gather a team of people to come up with a joint project. Yeah. Uh, some friends, some colleagues, some family members, or whoever. It could be people from Japan, or China, or US, or South America. You know, the internet brings us all together. So we can come up with any kind of project, as long as we manage to get the right experts on board. We could do anything. Um, so, for example, create such kind of funny toy castles, or toy cars, or maybe even real cars. I have recently seen a video uh, which has shown that those 3D printers can actually produce all the parts that are needed to produce those printers. So these are self-reproducing printers. And you can do the very same thing actually with building houses. So you can download now a full map of parts that you need to build your own house 
and it basically requires one machine and a few friends to build it up. You know, it will not be a villa so far, but anyway, this is really going to change the world. And so there is one other element that we need to learn about, which is self-organization and self-regulation. If we have this transition towards a more decentralized kind of organization, which I believe is an implication of complexity, as the complexity of the world reaches a certain level, we cannot organize it in a centralized way anymore. It requires more bottom-up participation. And um, I've been working a lot on traffic control, and we have learned actually to use local rules for the self-organization of traffic. Here you see green waves that are forming by themselves based on a principle that was inspired actually by pedestrians where we have observed that at bottlenecks there would be self-organized oscillatory flows as if there would be a traffic light for pedestrians, but there is none. It's a pressure principle that creates actually those oscillating flows. And so we have tra transferred this very same pressure principle, this very same local self-organization principle to traffic light control. And we have compared different kinds of organization of traffic systems. So today still a top-down kind of optimized service is quite common. So there is an expensive traffic center costs many millions, collects data from all over the city and then gives commands to traffic lights, at least some of the traffic lights. Um, and it turns out, as I will show you later, it's not the most efficient way of organizing your traffic flows in cities. Then there is another approach where basically every single intersection would take its own decisions and assume it would have the right sensor so it could actually minimize waiting times at this intersection strictly. It turns out this is not creating the best organization of your traffic flows because of a lack of coordination between neighboring intersections. So what is needed is that your intersections communicate with your neighboring intersection that they have an eye on the impact of the decision on the neighbors. So you need to have an other regarding self-regulation approach. But it can be local. And actually that creates the best possible traffic organization. You can see here the queue lengths for the self-regulated traffic flows is much smaller than actually for the optimal periodic service that is organized top-down, or for the local optimization according to this Adam Smith principle, saying that every intersection should just do what is best for that intersection. Yeah? So this is the proof that the invisible hand wouldn't always work if you don't find the right rules for self-regulation. And in fact, this concept of self-regulation will become more and more important also for our society. Because we know that reputation is something that people care about. And in the beginning we may not have taken this very seriously, you know, the like buttons and, and all this. But now we know that at eBay, for example, it really pays off to have a good reputation. You can sell your products at a higher price. And it's also good for the customers because they feel comfortable that they will get what they want. So reputation is going to self-stabilize the system. We just have to design these uh, reputation systems in the right way. I don't think at the moment we're doing it. We should give, um, have a multi-perspective approach a user-centric approach. It's not a company or a, some institution that uh, would decide the reputation of each single product, company, or individual 
for us, but we all have our own quality uh, definitions. And it's important, basically, that the way this reputation is actually created matches our quality perception. Now I'm coming towards the end of my work and would like uh, to remind of John von Neumann, who, who is, uh, I think, uh, closely related also uh, to Hungary. And uh, he was really a genius and kind of um, a pioneer, I would say, of future ICT. Why this? Because he has brought together physics, game theory, that means social science and economics, and computer science. So for the first time, maybe all those three fields have been brought together. And I'd like to suggest, therefore, uh, to come up with a John von Neumann Future ICT Prize for scientists who are doing great work. But I'd also like uh, to encourage you to re-establish the Collegium Budapest. It was really a great meeting place for scientists from all over the world, from different disciplines. I had the opportunity and pleasure to spend there about 10 months all together. And Actually, this is the place that started off my career, I would say. It was very important, actually, for the things that I've learned. And I think it's still influencing my thinking of today. It was a very important focus point for science. So, thank you very much for your interest and attention. Thanks again for your invitation. And good luck with future ICT in Hungary and beyond. First of all, I think uh, there is this unique opportunity that now, given the big data about human activity patterns, we can really learn about the way society and the economy works. We are in a quite curious situation that we know more about the universe than about our society. We really don't understand it well enough, and that is what makes us run into trouble all the time. It's very costly. There are many people dying of this, many people suffering, and I think if we had the right science, we could much improve the state of the world. Um, so, I think this collaboration of social scientists and complexity scientists and engineers and natural scientists will be able to unveil the riddles of society and the economy. There are regularities in human behavior and in the behavior of markets. We know this, but most of those regularities, these laws of society, have not yet been identified, they have not been formalized. And I think it's kind of maybe the biggest scientific challenge that is out there. I think it's actually the next natural step after we had physics as a queen of sciences for a long time and now biology and medicine seems to have taken over. As we learn to understand more and more complex systems, I think we'll eventually enter into this era of the social sciences. And social sciences, however, not just in a qualitative way, but also as a, a driver of innovation. So if you look at Facebook, for example, or Twitter, 
their success is based on very simple social mechanisms, such as signaling, communication, social networking. But our society is working in a much more sophisticated way, so there is a lot of potential for social inspired technologies that you could make billions with, and uh, that would help our society actually to organize itself, find new solutions to this really historical struggle between chaos and order that societies have always been facing. And I think we're just at this turning point, and in particular we're at this turning point because Moore's Law has created this explosion of computer power and storage capacity, and I don't think that in a few years we'll just return after the financial crisis to the situation we have been before. No, I think we're just in the middle of a fundamental transformation process, and um, so we don't want to be unprepared for this transition, historical transition, I would say. Um, we need to have an idea what's going to happen and what are the opportunities that are related uh, with these changes and also the risks. And I do think actually that the scientific disciplines and approaches that I've shortly sketched over here are offering tools that allow us uh, to make really fundamental and significant, significant contributions to the future of society. Any more? Uh, you can push a button on this microphone. You can push a button here and speak to the microphone. So, uh, then I try to explain someone the project, what the future I think is about. They are usually skeptic and, and say that well, there are these nice things, 3D printers and mobile phones and Twitter and all, all that stuff. But constantly modeling society and predicting what will happen and things like that. They say that this, this is just too complex and it will never happen. So they say that even a human cell or a human being is too complex to model, and how, how come that we try to model the society in large and how, 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 how will we handle this complexity issue? Do you have a good answer? I can tell. Well, most people who come up with this criticism and think we want to really to deterministically predict what uh, is going to happen in the future. That means basically write a history book uh, before history has happened. And of course, this is not our approach. Also, in physics, we have probabilistic models, because we know that there are limits of predictability. But still, we know that we can understand systemic instabilities, for example. And we can learn how to create more resilient and more sustainable systems. So principles of systems design to make the system work better. This is kind of uh, the main goal. But altogether, you know, there are still some things that are, to a certain extent, predictable. I was just mentioning Moore's Law. And for many decades, Moore's Law is actually applicable. And it has direct implications for the transformation of our society. Now, we all now using computers and sometimes back I've still met people who said that they would never get rid of their typewriter. Yeah? And I think even those people really are not using their typewriter anymore. It has fundamentally already changed our society, but it will change even more as the computers are reaching brain power. So this is something we really need to consider. So what makes uh, social processes uh, predictable? Demography, for example, is one of the things that creates some predictability. Now we get older, but we very much keep our tastes, our interests. So you can predict something can predict uh, approximately 
when people will die. All this is probabilistic. And whenever we do planning, like uh, road planning, planning of public infrastructure, schools, universities, and everything, we, we are basically projecting into the future. So from that point of view, no, it's, it's not really questioning everything which we have done in the past. Also on the individual level, we do something like a simulation in our brain of the potential personal scenario. So if you decide to invest many years of your life into studying a certain subject at university, then you basically do it because you predict you will have a good job afterwards. If you decide to marry a certain woman or man, uh, basically that also implies that you are trying to make a certain prediction about the close future of your life, or maybe for your whole life. Yeah, This is the idea of marriage. And uh, so basically everybody is doing predictions. We know they're not perfect, but we also know that certain things are predictable to a certain extent. So you would know that your friends would never do certain things. You would know that they would always do other things. And there are some things you don't know whether they would do them or not. Yeah? So this is basically that what creates uh, the possibility to come up with probabilistic law of human behavior. And then you need to consider also the large of uh, the, the law of large numbers that means averaging effects effects of interaction so for example if you drive a car on the street then if the density is high you cannot do much you know your location is basically determined by the surrounding cars so all of these things make behavior of humans predictable to a certain extent. Do you have one more? One more? Um, so everything is based on big data uh, in the future ICT, but uh, a crucial part of big data is owned by companies. Uh, so uh, what is your opinion on uh, how will the roles uh, of academia and industry in the, uh, in, in the future of innovations. It's true that a lot of the data is owned by companies, uh, but there are a number of trends that we need to consider. First of all, there is an open data movement, so more and more data are opened up for people, for everybody basically, because we see it's creating benefits. It's creating benefits for society, it's creating benefits for individuals, and it's actually creating business opportunities. So I think it's basically the, the fuel of <coughs> new businesses coming up. Of course, everybody could come up with their own algorithms and software suit uh, to use these data to offer services to other people. So a smart society would make sure there would be enough data that these businesses would be possible. Um, the other thing is that, of course, we are now entering the age of uh, the Internet of Things. So there will be sensors all over our world distributed in our environments, and it will create masses of data, and the more companies are implementing and distributing these sensors, the more competition will there be, the more data will be produced, the cheaper will they be. That means now big data is an expensive thing, but it will become very cheap actually. And uh, that's why I believe uh, there is not a problem in a few years to have the data that scientists would need. And also, you can come up with an own smartphone app and say, okay, well, in principle, we don't need to buy all the uh, sensors and distribute them all over the world. Every user is buying 
an own smartphone, basically. So they're doing the job for you. The only thing you need to do is to come up with a smartphone app that is using those sensors to collect data of ores based on an informed consent. And so, but uh, in, in principle, if scientists all over the world would say, okay, let's create this platform together, we, we have all the sensors we need. Now we just, just need to convince people to contribute data and to make sure that this data will be mined in a way, collected in a way that is ethically acceptable. All right, it seems that uh, questions have been answered. Thank you once again, and good luck with your project.